by guys we are carrying on today with fantastic mr so before we begin think back to the text you've read earlier in the week okay recap in your head what has happened you might want to read the summary that you wrote as part of yesterday's lesson to help you with that okay let's continue the story today we're looking at chapter five and six and this is your reminder as soon as a new page comes onto the video pause it and try and read it yourself or read it on the screen on your computer screen or if you've downloaded the text yourself chapter five the terrible tractors as the sun rose the next morning boggis and bunts and bean were still digging they had dug a hole so deep you could have put a house into it but they had not yet come to the end of the fox's tunnel. They were all very tired and cross. Dang and blast, said Boggis. Whose rotten idea was this? Bean's idea, said Bunce. Boggis and Bunce both stared at Bean. Bean took another swig of cider, then put the flask back into his pocket without offering it to the others. Listen, he said angrily. I want that fox. I'm going to get that fox. I'm not giving in till I've strung him up over my front porch dead as a dumpling we can't get him by digging that's for sure said the fat boggis i've had enough of digging bunce the little pot-bellied dwarf looked up at bean and said have you got any more stupid ideas then what said bean i can't hear you bean never took a bath he never even washed as a result his ear holes were clogged with all kinds of muck and wax and bits of chewing gum and dead flies and stuff like that. This made him deaf. Speak louder, he said to Bunce. And Bunce shouted back, Got any more stupid ideas? Bean rubbed the back of his neck with a dirty finger. He had a boil coming there and it itched. What we need on this job, he said, is machines mechanical shovels we'll have him out in five minutes with mechanical shovels this was a pretty good idea and the other two had to admit it all right then bean said taking charge boggis you stay here and see the fox doesn't escape bunce and i will go and fetch our machinery if he tries to get out shoot him quick the long thin bean walked away the tiny bunch trotted after him the fat boggis stayed where he was with his gun pointing at the foxhole. Soon, two enormous caterpillar tractors with mechanical shovels on their front ends came clanking into the wood. Bean was driving one, Bunce the other. The machines were both black. They were murderous, brutal-looking monsters. Here we go then, shouted Bean. Death to the fox, shouted Bunce. The machines went to work, biting huge mouthfuls of soil out of the hill. The big tree under which Mr Fox had dug his hole in the first place was toppled like a matchstick. On all sides, rocks were sent flying and trees were falling and the noise was deafening. Down in the tunnel, the foxes crouched, listening to the terrible clanging and banging overhead. "'What's happening, Dad?' cried the small foxes. "'What are they doing?' Mr Fox didn't know what was happening or what they were doing. It's an earthquake, cried Mrs Fox. Look, said one of the small foxes, our tunnels got shorter, I can see daylight. They all looked around and yes, the mouth of the tunnel was only a few feet away from them now and in the circle of daylight beyond they could see the two huge black tractors almost on top of them. Tractors, shouted Mr Fox. And mechanical shovels. Dig for your lives. Dig. Dig. Chapter 6. The Race. Now there began a desperate race. The machines against the foxes. In the beginning, the hill looked like this. After about an hour, as the machines bit away more and more soil from the hilltop, it looked like this. Sometimes the foxes would gain a little ground and the clanking noises would grow fainter. And Mr Fox would say, we're going to make it, I'm sure we are. But then a few moments later, the machines would come back at them and the crunch of the mighty shovels would get louder and louder. 
once the foxes actually saw the sharp metal edge of one of the shovels as it scraped the earth just behind. Keep going, my darlings, panted Mr Fox. Don't give up. Keep going, the fat boggish shouted to Bunce and Bean. We'll get him any moment now. Have you caught sight of him yet? Bean called back. Not yet, shouted Boggis, but I think you're close. I'll pick him up with my bucket, shouted Bunce. I'll chop him to pieces. But by lunchtime the machines were still at it, and so were the poor foxes. The hill now looked like this. The farmers didn't stop for lunch. They were too keen to finish the job. Hey there, Mr Fox, yelled Bunce, leaving, leaning out of his tractor. We're coming to get you now. You've had your last chicken, yelled Boggis. You'll never come prowling around my farm again. A sort of madness had taken hold of the three men. The tall, skinny bean and dwarfish pot-bellied Bunce were driving their machines like maniacs, racing the motors and making the shovels dig at a terrific speed. The fat Boggis was hopping about like a, der like a dervish and shouting, Faster, faster! By five o'clock in the afternoon, this is what had happened to the hill. The hole the machines had dug was like the crater of a volcano. It was such an extraordinary sight that crowds of people came rushing out from the surrounding villages to have a look. They stood on the edge of the crater and stared down at Boggis and Bunce and Bean. Hey there, Boggis. What's going on? We're after a fox. <laughs> you must be mad. The people jeered and laughed. But this only made the three farmers more furious and more obstinate and more determined than ever not to give up until they had caught the fox. OK, your five quick round questions and the sentence stems are Question one. What word does Boggish use to describe Bean's idea? Question two. Why can't Bean hear what the other two farmers are saying? Question three. Who was the race between? Question four. What do you think the phrase bit away more and more soil means on page 25? And question five. Why did the surrounding villagers laugh and jeer at the three farmers at the end of the chapter? Pause this now and have a go at answering those in your books. Okay, well done, guys. So Boggish uses the word rotten describe Bean's idea. Bean can't hear what the other farmers are saying because his ear holes were clogged, if you remember, with all sorts of muck and wax, meaning he couldn't hear. Um, Roald Dahl paints a pretty grim picture, doesn't he, of Bean, saying that he doesn't wash. Um, he doesn't sound very hygienic. Um, question three, the race was between the machines and the foxes. Question four, I think bit away more and more soil means... I think Roald Dahl means that the diggers took a little bit more soil away every time. Okay, in question five, the villagers laughed and jeered at the three farmers because they thought they were mad for digging a hole that big just to catch a fox. They actually say, don't they, if we go back to that page, you must be mad. They think they're mad. I think they're going a little bit crazy. Okay, so your brain power questions are... Question six, how does Roald Dahl make us dislike the farmers? Can you use some examples from the text to support this? Okay. Question seven, why does Roald Dahl call the tractors murderous, brutal looking monsters? How does he keep this metaphor going? Okay. And then question eight is choose one of the three farmers. So you could have Bunce, Boggis or Bean. Okay, and write four sentences to describe their characters. You can use the text from today. Also use from yesterday and Monday to help you with this. Okay, remember all the lovely adjectives that Roald Dahl has used throughout to paint a picture of these characters. As the reader, we feel we've got a really good understanding of their characters now. So if you need to, use your text and go back over the last six chapters, picking one farmer... And go back if you want a really good technique would be to highlight any information that you are given about the farmer you've chosen um and then we, i want you to write four sentences to describe that character okay
pause while you have a go at that. Okay, good job, guys. So question six, some of the ideas that you might have included in. Um, how does Roald Dahl make us dislike the farmers? Okay, so there are lots of examples here. I've not been able to choose just one page to show you. I've copied and pasted different parts um, from throughout the two chapters that we've read. Um, so we've got Bunce, the little pot-bellied dwarf, looked up at Bean and said, have you got any more stupid ideas? This bit makes us dislike the farmers because they're not very kind to each other, are they? We know from that song earlier from by the children that they're not very kind or that, that in fact they're actually quite mean um but this kind of solidifies that it confirms that they're they're not even kind to people that they're working with they should be working as a team but in fact they're being quite nasty to each other boggis and bunts both stared at bean bean took another swig of cider and put the flask back into his pocket without offering it to the others that shows us that he's all that they're also quite selfish okay that makes us dislike somebody if they're selfish. Here, we've got that little extract that we just talked about. Um, saying Bean never took a bath. We get the impression, not just of Bean, but of the other... I don't know about you, but me as the reader, I'm getting the impression that the other two farmers aren't actually that clean either. Um, so that makes me dislike them. I wouldn't want to be friends with them if, if they didn't wash or they weren't very clean. Um, so yeah and then also the people jeered and laughed but this only made the three farmers more furious and more obstinate and more determined than ever not to give up until they'd caught the fox so again we're getting through that we're getting the impression that they're really quite determined and they are not going to stop until that fox is dead okay so we've got that they're unkind to each other and the foxes, they're selfish, they're unclean and unpleasant to be around and that they're angry and they're determined to kill the foxes. So all of these are just some ideas that you might have picked up on or you might have used to describe what Roald Dahl does, uh, does to make us dislike the farmers. Okay. Lovely words um we've got clanging we've got banging um let's have a quick look we've got another here where was it um clanking okay so we're given lots and lots of noises and monsters might make those sorts of noises as well okay so all of those things keep that metaphor going and the fact that they just work so fast and that they're creating so much carnage and so much so much mess really um that gives us the impression that they're murderous and they don't care what what damage they're causing they are here to do a job okay and then your last question for today and again there's no right answer for that whether you choose boggies or bunts or bean you have got to choose one of them and have a go at writing four sentences to describe their character if you wanted to you could do it as like a wanted poster um it's completely up to you as long as you write us those four sentences Hi, class three. Okay, so firstly, before we get started with today's learning in maths, um, we'll just check yesterday's answers. So yesterday you were checking, you were finding out um, unit fractions of amounts. So I'll just very quickly with my purple pen, fly through these answers for you. Um, just tick them off as you go along. And if you haven't got any right, or sorry, if you've made a mistake, don't stress. Um, have another look at it. I'm not going to go through every single one how we worked it out, um, but you can go back and watch yesterday's video again if you want to and have another go at it and see if you can get it right. Okay, so for the first one it was one fifth of 15. So we worked out that the, the trick is to divide by the denominator. Now, our denominator is five. Okay, so we're doing 15 divided by five, which equals three. Okay, so one fifth of 15 was three. One fifth of 25, so that's 25 divided by our denominator, 
5 and 25 divided by 5 is 20. Oh gosh, 5. Um, and then when we're looking at thirds, our denominator is now into three equal parts. So one third of 21 is 7. One third of 36 is 12. And then onto quarters, we're now dividing by four equal parts. We're splitting a whole amount into four equal parts. We've got 24, so one quarter of 24. Now there's another trick we can do when we're finding quarters um, because a quarter is half of a half. So we can half 24, which would give us 12, and we can half it again, which would give us six. But we also know that four times six is 24. So one quarter of 24 is six. And the last one, one eighth of 56. So you're dividing 56 into 8. Um, if you're finding 8, you can also find half. Half again into quarters, and an eighth is half of a quarter as well, so we can half it again. Okay, so we can do half of 56 is 28. Half of 28 is 14, and half of 14 is 7. OK, we also know that 8 times 7 is 56, so we can use our inverse there to help us. So have a look at those. If you got them all right, fantastic. Well done. If you got one or two wrong, if you made it just a silly mistake, that's OK. Can you work out what that mistake was um, and how we can make sure we, we don't do it again? Um, and if you really you're really not sure where you've gone wrong, that's OK. Have another look at yesterday's lesson if you want to, um, because today we're going to be moving on to finding non-unit fractions of amounts. So we really need to have understood this before moving on to the next point. If you're drawing bar models to help you, that's absolutely fine. You can carry on doing that because that will be really helpful for today as well. Um, I secure it from yesterday then. So Gary says to find one third of 24, he needs to divide 24 into two equal parts. Do you agree? So he says that one third of the, it was finding one third of 24. He thinks you divide it into two equal parts. Now, if he did that, he'd have got 12. And one third of 24 is not 12. Now, if he's divided it into two equal parts, what would be the fraction that he's actually found? Well, he's looking for one third. So how many equal parts should he have split 24 into? It should have been into three equal parts. So really, he should have been doing 24 divided by three, OK, which would have given him eight. If he did it into two equal parts, and he's looking at one of those equal parts, he's just finding one half of 24, which we should know would have been 12. OK, so Gary's not quite understood there the rule about finding a fraction of an amount and that we divide by the denominator. OK, he's just thinking maybe he's just got that fraction one half stuck in his head, perhaps, or he knows that he can divide 24 into two nice and equally and easily. Um, so that might be the problem that he's made there. So hopefully you've got that. If you've got that, um, if you've put no, you do not agree. You get a mark for that. So you get a tick for that. If you've told me what the answer should be, one third of 24 is eight, you get an answer for that. Uh, sorry, a tick for that, a mark for it. Um, but if you've already also shown me that um, finding uh, splitting 24 into two equal parts would actually give you one half. So if you've done this working out here as well, you can get another mark for that. So that's a total of one, two, three, is that? Yeah, I think three marks. Well done, guys. OK, so on to today's learning then. So pause me in just a second so you can write down today's date and a learning objective, which is to find non-unit fractions of amounts. So pause me now so you can get that down. OK, super. So you should be ready for today then. OK, I've got on here for you one, two, three, four different fractions. Um, so before we carry on, I just want to check that we remember the difference between a unit fraction and a non-unit fraction. So which of these fractions here are non-unit fractions? We've got one third, three quarters, two thirds and one quarter. OK, which ones of those are non-unit fractions? So pause me to have a quick think and then carry on playing me so we can check. 
Okay, so a unit fraction we know is when our numerator is one, when we're looking at one out of however many equal parts. So it cannot be one third and it can't be one quarter. Now a non-unit fraction is any fraction where your numerator is not one unit. Okay, so three quarters is a non-unit fraction and two thirds is a non-unit fraction. So I've got a little question here just to get us started for today's session. What does the numerator tell us? Well, when we're looking at fractions, we know that the denominator, okay, our denominator, our bottom number, the downwards number, that tells us how many equal parts there are all together. Okay. Now, our numerator is just telling us how many of those equal parts we are looking at. So today, the fractions that we're looking at will not have one on top. We're going to be looking at more than one equal part of amounts today. OK, so yesterday we look, focused on just one of our equal parts. OK, but today our numerators are going to be different. Sometimes they're two, sometimes they're three. Um, it depends on what the fraction is. OK. We are still going to use that rule though. We are still going to be finding a fraction of an amount by dividing by the denominator, but there's going to be an extra step today. Okay, so let's first start with what we know. We've got uh, our whole amount here is 18. Okay, and we are looking for uh, two thirds. So firstly, we're going to divide by the denominator. Our denominator is three. So that is why on my bar model, I've already got one, two, three equal parts there. I'm going to divide 18 by three. Okay, so I'm going to quickly think how many threes go into 18. What do I times three by to get 18? Three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, six. Okay, so I've got six in my three equal parts. I know that six and six is 12. I don't know the six is 18. Okay, so now if I've got one third, just one of these equal parts here would be six. Okay, but I've not got one third. I've got two thirds. So I'm actually now going to circle. I'm going to do it in a red. So hopefully it will stand out. I'll do it in this dark red actually. Um, I'm looking at two of my three equal parts. Okay, so I'm looking at two of those sixes, not just one, I'm not looking at one third, I'm looking at two. Okay, so I've circled two of my three equal parts. So pause me now, what is two thirds of 18? Okay, so hopefully then you've all you've had to do there is add our two parts together, which is two sixes. Okay, so what are two lots of six, double six? Hopefully you have got that two thirds of 18 is 12. Okay, so what we've done there is we've still divided by our denominator. So we did 18, we divided it by three. Okay, and that gave us six. Okay, and then what we did with that six, we actually multiplied it. What did we multiply it by? We multiplied it by two because two is our numerator. So we multiplied it by the numerator. Okay, and our numerator is two. So we've got 12. Now, there are two ways we can do this. You can, do, you can set this out when we're working it out together. You can do it by do, drawing a bar model like this and circling the whole amounts, the whole equal, the equal parts that we're looking at, sorry. Or you can set it out with your calculations like this. OK, either way, you can do both if you really want to, to check that you've 100% got it. That would be absolutely fine. Um, I'm going to do a couple more examples together and then you're going to do your do it by yourself. OK. Now here I've got, I'm looking at two thirds again, but I'm looking at two thirds of 12. OK, so I've, I've got my bar model up here and I've got my three equal parts because we our fraction, our denominator is in uh, three equal parts. So we want to split 12 into three equal parts. And we're looking at two of those three equal parts. So to remember to find a fraction of the amount, we divide by the denominator. So we're going to be dividing 12 into three. So can you do that now, please? You can have a go at this in your book as a practice. So pause me if you haven't. Brilliant. OK, so hopefully then you've done 12 divided by three. Now I know that 12 divided by three, I'm going to write it down over here, actually. 
So we know that 12, I'm dividing it by my denominator, which is 3. 12 divided by 3. Now I'm just going to write up here, actually. Divide by that, then multiply by that. OK, so 12 divided by 3 is 4. OK, so I've got 4 in each of those. And remember, if you're still not 100% sure in doing that sort of quick dividing in your head, if you want to um, share out dots into your bar model, you can. So I've done 12 divided by 3 and I've got 4. Now our numerator, we're not looking at one third. We're not just looking at one of them. OK, we're looking at two of them. So we need to look at two lots. Which means we're doing 4 and we're timesing that by 2 because our numerator is 2. OK, and 4 times 2 is, hopefully you've all screamed at the computer, 8. OK, so 2 thirds of 12 is 8. So all we did there was we divided by the denominator, then multiplied by the numerator. OK. Brilliant. OK, could you now have another go at this one? Now, check out the fraction carefully. Don't let me trick you. OK, what's different about this fraction? Our, our denominator is five. So we've got five equal parts. One, two, three, four, five. Our whole amount is 15 and we need to split that into five equal parts. But how many of those equal parts are we looking at now? How am I trying to trick you? So what are you going to be multiplying by at the end this time instead? OK, so pause me, have a little go at this one first and then I'll go through it with you when you're done. OK, so hopefully then you might have drawn it as a bar model. You might have done the calculations. You might have done both. Either way is fine. Um, it's what makes sense to you. If you want to do both, just to double, double check um, and check that you've got the same answers both ways. That's even better. I, I like to be really thorough. So. 15, I'd, we'd, whenever we find the fraction of amount, we divide by the denominator. So 15 divided by 5, I'm going to write it down here. 15 divided by 5. OK, we all know our 5s. We know that is 3. OK, so we should have 3, 3, 3, 3. Three. Perfect. OK, we divided it by the uh, denominator. So what do we do next? Now, the first time yesterday when we were looking at unit fractions, we were just looking at one of those equal parts. So our answer would have been three. Just now we've been looking at finding two thirds. So we've been looking at two of those equal parts. But now our numerator is three. And remember, we need to now multiply by our numerator. OK, now how many have we got there? Now we've started up. In one of those, we've got three. So we need to multiply that. How many equal parts are we looking at? So it's one, two, three. We're going to be looking at those. OK, so we're looking at three, lots of three. Oh, oh, oh what am I doing? Silly Miss Cunning. I'm sure you'll all be laughing at me there. OK, so three lots of three is nine. Again, hopefully you're all shouting that out. OK, did I trick anybody there? I bet I did. OK, next one then. Have a little look at it. How have I tried to trick you again? What is different about this fraction of an amount? So I've got three quarters. So I've got three as my numerator, but we need to split it into four equal parts to begin with. Our whole amount is 16. So we're looking at three quarters of 16. So pause me and have a little go at yourself first and then we'll check it together. OK, so hopefully then you've started with your whole amount like before. So we've got 16. OK, and we always divide by the denominator. So we are dividing by our denominator, which is four, four equal parts. OK, and 16 divided into these four equal parts is four. I love that um, multiplication, four times four equals 16. I don't know why. It's always stuck in my head. Um, OK, and then what is the extra rule that we do when we're finding non-unit fractions? We then look at our numerator, which is three, and we multiply by our numerator, remember? So we've got four here, but we're looking at three of these equal parts. So actually doing four multiplied by three. 
Okay, 4 times 3, this is another one of my favourite multiplications, I think, is 12. Okay, those three fours together. 4 at 4 is 8, add another 4 is 12. Okay, so 3 quarters of 16 is 12. Right, now is your turn to have a go on your own in your book. OK, now, if you were unsure, if you don't feel ready, just rewind me back and have a look at some more of those practices um, on your own. And then again with me, whatever you like. Um, and now have a go at this in your book, please. Please, please, please pay attention to where I have definitely tried to trick you. To begin with, I've got you looking at two thirds of nine, then two thirds of 21. And then go up here to two fifths of 25 and then three fifths of 30 then three quarters of 12 and three quarters of 24 what i might do just to help make that look a little bit clearer um i oh, don't want it in black one second sorry guys i'll just break them down like that for you okay now i've definitely definitely tried to trick you see if you can not be tricked OK, so have a go at those in your book. Um, remember, guys, if you do your working out, it will really help us work out where you might have gone wrong if you get any, if you make any little mistakes. All right. If you do get stuck, do go back and have a look. So remember, you are, let me type this at the bottom for you. We've said that we divide by the numer, no, we don't, sorry, divide by the denominator, then multiply by the Hopefully you're screaming at me. Numerator. OK, so divide by the denominator, then multiply by the numerator. All right. Draw your bar models if you need to. OK, so when you uh, get started on that, then pause me. And then when you're done, play me again and we'll look at the security together. So pause now. OK, well done, guys. So hopefully you finished all of your do it. Here is your secure it, then your extra challenge. Now, this is something that I think some others may be doing today. Um, but Gary says that to find two thirds of 24, you divide by two and multiply by three. He says the answer is 36. Do you agree? Explain your answer. So I've written it out again here. So two thirds. So two equal parts out of the three altogether of 24 is 36. I divided 24 by two, so we divided by his two, and then he times it by three. Do you agree? Has he done that correct there, or do you disagree? Let me know, you can get an answer, you can get a mark for telling me whether you agree or not correctly. If you explain your answer, okay, and then tell me what the answer should be if he's not correct. All right, um, and we will mark those first thing of tomorrow's lesson. Good luck, guys. Any problems at all, do message me. Um, you can email me um, and send me pictures of your work. That's absolutely fine. OK, good luck, guys. Have a great day. Bye. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our writing session for today. Um, we're going to start off our writing session just like we did yesterday by spotting those mistakes that have been made. So we're off to our sentence doctor. Our two sentences today that we're going to be looking at are why do I need to do my homework and what a beautiful day Peter said and you'll notice here that we're looking for five punctuation mistakes can you spot them all we're looking capital letters full stops speech marks apostrophes it might be question marks commas any punctuation that's missing from these sentences and we're looking for five bits that are missing what I'd like you to do is pause the video copy out those two sentences but correct those five mistakes, then come back to me ready for the answers. OK, super. Do you think you've got all five? Let's have a look. So these are our punctuation mistakes for today. We were missing that capital letter at the start of the sentence, a nice easy one to spot for why. The I was wrong. Lots of people do this in their writing. They did a little lowercase I and not a capital. We all know that it's a personal pronoun. It needs capital. And um, why do I need my homework? Of course, is a question. So it needed a question mark at the end. So three pieces in that. We've also got that keyword we had yesterday with said. So we know we needed speech marks. We even included one set of speech marks, but we hadn't started them off. So we've got what a beautiful day. And it's an exclamation sentence. What a beautiful day. So it needs an exclamation mark. Well done to you if you got all five of those today. 
let's have a look what we're going to be working on for the rest of this week. So, today we're learning to understand the purpose and the structure of a discussion text. Now, I know for lots of you, discussion texts are going to be absolutely brand new. So, we're going to have a look in lots of detail today about what that's about. But this question of should Fox be shot is something that we're going to be thinking about all the way through our next few days. So, my first question to you is, what do you think? So, we've got our story so far, and we know that Fox is stealing things from the farmers, and that the farmers have tried to shoot him. So, can you have a little think for me? Do you think Fox should be shot? And what's your reason for that? So, just pause the video, have a think, and then come back to me. Okay, so there are loads of reasons both why Fox should be shot, but why he shouldn't be as well. So you might have thought of some of these reasons. So if you were the farmer and you were thinking he should be shot, you'd be thinking because he's stealing the chickens, because he's frightening the chickens, um, maybe because he's taking things that don't belong to him, he's stealing might be your answer. But maybe you thought, no, Fox shouldn't be shot. And you were thinking like Mrs. Fox and you were saying no, He's only collecting food for his family. His family would starve without it. Um, foxes are supposed to eat chickens. So why would we want to stop them? So there are loads of reasons both why he should be shot maybe and why he shouldn't. Which is why we need a discussion text. And we're going to have a little bit of a look at that. So today's focus is to understand the purpose and the structure of a discussion text. So we're going to be writing one about should fox be shot. And we're going to use a discussion or what we call a balanced argument. That's when there is a question that's posed to us that's got some reasons why it should happen and some reasons why it shouldn't happen. Um, and we're going to share both sides of that argument. So the, the discussion is structured like this. It's a bit of an introduction that tells us some information about the issue. So what the fox is doing. Then there'll be some reasons for, so this will be the time when our farmers can put their point of view across. These are the reasons why we think fox should be shot. Then this will be the reason time when maybe Mrs Fox can put her point of view across because these will be the reasons why Fox shouldn't be shot. And then there's a bit of a conclusion at the end where you as the writer, as the author, get to share your opinion about what you think should happen. OK, and we're going to be writing one of these discussion texts on Thursday and Friday. So today's about finding out some more about it from practising some of the key um, words that we're going to be using in it and then we're going to get preparing for writing over the next few days. So first of all we're going to have a look at a discussion text. So this one isn't about fox and it's not about being shot but it's about animals so it's do we still need zoos? So some people think we do need zoos, other people think no nope, we don't need zoos anymore. So this is why we have a balanced argument because we've got two different points of view with this okay. So I'm going to read it to you and then we're going to have a little think about what the purpose of this part of the text is. What is it trying to tell us? So that's what I want you to think about while I read it through to you. Okay. Do we still need zoos? Zoos were originally set up so that people could see and learn about the wild animals from different lands. As more people became city dwellers, never seeing animals in the wild, zoos began to house local animals too. But this has caused some people to become very angry. The issue of whether zoos are morally right remains a major issue with people raising valid arguments both for and against. Yet a difficult decision must be made. Are zoos really necessary? So what do you think the purpose of this part of the text is? What's its job within the text that we're reading? You're absolutely right to spot it's the introduction. It's telling us a little bit more information about the, the text that we're going to read. So first of all, it tells us a bit about the subject. So it tells us that zoos were originally set up so that people could learn about animals and that they housed animals from distant lands and local animals. So it gives us a bit of information. It also tells us why the discussion is really important. So it may, remains a major issue with people raising arguments on both sides. So it tells us why it's important for us to even carry on reading. It's enthralling us as part of the reader as well, as well as informing us. Okay, let's read on a little bit more. Okay, so this one 
is going to give us some reasons why zoos should be banned for good. So three reasons. And as I'm reading through, I want you to see if you can listen out for the three different reasons that the author gives. I also want you to have a little think about what the author does perhaps to persuade you even more that they should be closed. Okay, let's read it through. Looking out for three reasons, looking out for those tools, those tips, those techniques that the author uses to help persuade you that they should be closed in this particular paragraph. Okay, so on the one hand, some people believe that zoos should be banned for good. Every day, people can see or increase their knowledge of any wild animal in its natural habitat because they can simply tune into a TV programme or buy a video. This has led some animal rights activists to claim that zoos are out of date, even though thousands of people visit them every year. They argue that it's extremely cruel to capture creatures for them in the wild, transport them over long distances and then keep them holed up in minuscule cages or enclosures just so human beings can be entertained. Shockingly, zoologist Matt Jenkins, who is a leading expert in this field, has stated that zoocosis, which is abnormal behaviour like rocking or swaying, is often developed by captive animals, which shows they are bored and unhappy in their prison-like conditions. He therefore concludes that it is wrong to keep animals in environments which could cause such stress to them even if some zoos are trying their best to mimic what life might be like in the wild. So, let's have a little think about those three different reasons. Whilst I was reading, was anybody able to spot the three different reasons why we should close the zoos? Okay, so did you spot this one? This one says that zoos are out of date. We don't need them anymore. We've got the internet, we've got videos, we've got TVs, we can look at animals online, we don't need a view, a, a, a zoo. Okay? Another one you might have spotted is this one, that it's cruel to capture the different creatures from the wild and hold them up in those minuscule cages or enclosures. And then the third one that I spotted was about causing the animals stress. So we did wrong to keep them in environments that could cause such stress. So those were the three reasons for closing the zoos. Let's have a little think and see if we can spot how the different animals, how the different, how the author tries to persuade us perhaps with this. So the author does this in a couple of different ways. Let's have a look at these. So minuscule cages would be one of them. Prison-like conditions would be another. They're bored and unhappy. Does anybody know what the author's doing here with these types of words and phrases? Okay, you're absolutely right. He's used these words and phrases because they make zoos sound really bad and they're what we call emotive words and emotive phrases so what they do is they make us feel bad about the animals being kept in there so they are helping to persuade us another thing that the author does here is he talks to a leading expert a very important person someone who knows lots and lots about the subject and he tells us what he thinks and that he therefore concludes here really, really helps, really helps to show us how to persuade us that this might be the right set of conditions, so we should be banning those zoos altogether. But what makes discussion different from a persuasive text is that it doesn't just give us the reasons why we should close the zoos, it also gives us the reasons why we shouldn't close the zoos too. So let's have a look at those in our next paragraph. Just rub that out. Okay. Let's have a look at this one. So while we're looking at this particular text, this is going to give us the three reasons against why we should keep the zoos open. And again, I want you to see if you can spot different ways that the author persuades you in this 
opposite paragraph because we're giving it the opposite point of view. So it says, on the other hand, many people argue that zoos are still necessary in the modern world. Numerous people state there is a huge difference between watching an animal on a screen and seeing it in real life. It could be argued that visiting a zoo is educational, often increasing people's concern for wildlife and conservation, whereas just watching an animal on television is less inspiring. Indeed, sometimes the only way to save endangered species may be to create to arrange for it to breed in captivity so that it can be looked after by specialists and continue to reproduce. Incredibly, more than 32% of animals at risk of extinction have been saved because of the work carried out in zoos. Behind the scenes, scenes zoos also provide scientists with opportunities to research into animal behaviour. Although older zoos might need updating or closing, Modern zoos can be much better planned and provide animals with carefully designed enclosures appropriate to their needs. The animal cages can be larger and features added to make them feel like they are still in the wild. With enough space to exercise, surely these are convincing enough arguments to condone the running of zoos and show how vitally important they can be. So if we have a little think about the reasons against did you spot three reasons why we should keep the zoos open? Okay, so the first one that I spotted is that it's very different watching an animal on screen than it is watching, seeing it in real life. Oh, it's a very wiggly line. Okay, that was the first one that I spotted. The next one that I saw was this one, conservation an endangered species. So what the author's trying to tell us here is that if we don't have them in zoos, then some of these animals are going to die out. So that seems a really good reason to keep zoos open. And then the final one that I spotted was that lots of our modern zoos have enough space to exercise. Okay, so they're stopping that argument that the zoos are too small. Okay, the other thing that I asked you to look out for was how the author helped to persuade you. Now, it does something slightly different here. It does this. Does anybody know what that is? Okay, 32%. It gives us facts and figures. When it gives you facts and figures, it tends to make us as a reader think that it's more real. It's more real life if we've got those facts and those numbers. It also does something down here. And it asks us a question. Surely... We can't possibly disagree and it asks us a direct question so that really helps us to be persuaded as well you'll also notice it uses that in that emotive language that we talked about earlier we've got inspired we've got endangered we've got an um, extinction we've saved the animals lots of those words are really really carefully designed would be another one Lots of those words really help us to believe that this might be the best option. Okay, so we're going to have a look at the very last section of this text. So this is our conclusion, okay? So here we go. There we go. So our conclusion is at the very end, very end of our text, and it is there to sum up the argument and to tell us what the author thinks. So let's find out. It says, in conclusion, having carefully considered both sides of the argument, it seems that there are still arguments for retaining zoos, for keeping zoos open. These should, however, be carefully planned with the animal's welfare in mind, because in the modern world, there is no excuse for keeping animals in cramped or cruel conditions. So it tells us that the author wants to keep the zoos, but we've got to make sure we're looking after those animals carefully. So what we're going to have a look at today is thinking about that purpose of the text. So the purpose of the text that we've just read about the zoos is to discuss and it gives our reader both sides of the argument. It told us why to keep zoos open and it told us why to close the zoos. And it gives us all of that information so that the reader can make up their own mind. They can decide what they think and the author gives them their point of view as well. Okay, so... How does the author do that? How does he give us both sides of the argument? How does he try to inform us 
of those different arguments and how does he try to almost persuade us pause the video have a little think write down a list of all the different ways that the author tries to inform you and persuade you from the text that we've just looked at okay so let's have a little think did you spot any of these so we talked about the facts and numbers it was 32 percent, wasn't it so we talked about facts and numbers helping to give us that information to inform us we talked about the expert opinions that we were given as well we looked at the structure the conclusion and the introduction that helps to give us that information we looked about that persuasive language that emotive language that made us think that one argument was better than the other it was also balanced if you notice, we looked for three arguments for and three arguments against. It's not one-sided. It doesn't give us more of one than the other. So it gives us a balanced argument. And it also used lots and lots of connectives to show different viewpoints. So things like on the other hand, however, although, it gives us the opposite point of view at the same point in time. We could also have had maybe questions on there, which we had a little look at, um, that might have added to that as well. So some examples of these from what we saw was that 32% of animals at risk are persuasive language were minuscule cages and endangered species. We'd got our connectives on the other hand, however, and we'd got that zoologist Matt Jenkins, which was our expert opinion. So today's lesson, we're going to really, really focus on this one, the connectives which show the different viewpoints. And we're going to have a little bit of a practice with these before we get onto our writing properly. So these are our challenges for today. So challenge one is to use conjunctions to show opposition. So you're going to be writing some sentences for me that say some people think this, however, other people think this. OK, so you're going to use conjunctions to show opposition. Challenge number two is to use the conjunctions to show opposition. But you're also going to use conjunctions to show cause as well. So if you have a look at the example section, some people think that computers are better than iPads because the cause reason they have more space to save your work however is our opposition other people think that ipads are better because they are smaller so given the reason you can carry them around more easily so you're going to write your sentences using both opposition conjunctions and causal conjunctions okay if you're really 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 up for the challenge today you're going to be completing challenge three and you're going to be using opposition conjunctions cause conjunctions and addition conjunctions today for your different arguments so this goes a little bit like this some people think that computers are in better than ipads because they have more space to save your work in addition adding even more information they are faster and can do more than ipads however giving us the opposite point of view other people think that ipads are better because they are smaller so giving us the reason, the cause, you can carry them around more easily and they're great for watching movies on, okay? So you can choose your level of challenge. You can choose whether you can use just opposition, opposition and causal conjunctions or opposition, causal and addition conjunctions and these are your arguments, okay? So your first argument is, are films just as good as books? What I'd like you to do is do, some people think that, and give me a reason other people think that give me the reasons and then use your conjunctions just like in the examples that we looked at okay so pause your video here and have a go Okay, ready for your next argument. So, argument number two. Should chips be banned from the school lunch menu? Okay, same thing. Some people think they should. Some people think they shouldn't. Use your oppositional conjunctions for challenge one. Oppositional and addition for challenge two. And, sorry, oppositional and causal for challenge two. And oppositional addition and and causal for challenge three pause the video now and come back to me when you've written your answers okay on to challenge number three then 
So this is our next argument. Should children under 10 have mobile phones? Some people think they should. Some people think they shouldn't. Why do they think they should? Why do they think they shouldn't? Remember, challenge one, just oppositional conjunctions. Challenge two, oppositional and causal conjunctions. Challenge three, all three within your sentences to answer that question. Off you go. Okay, so hopefully you should have been able to answer those questions. Remember that you can send them through to Miss Cunnington and Miss Foster on our email addresses. And hopefully you've had a little bit of practice with those causal conjunctions and with those oppositional conjunctions. And we're going to need that learning tomorrow when we start to write our argument. Okay, we're going to go on to our final bit of connected curriculum today. This is the same as we've been doing on Monday and on Tuesday. We're learning about the world, we're learning about countries, we're learning about locations of different things. Remembering please that in your work packs, your PDF that's attached to this, you've got all of your different challenges with all of the websites and information that you need. You're either supposed to be making top trumps cards or an interactive world map or an information poster about one of the wonders of the world. We really can't wait to see them. Please make sure you send them into Miss Cunnington or Miss Foster, and I will see you again tomorrow with another set of challenges. Bye, guys. Have a great day.